Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you here with us for this historical event tonight. Uh, my name is Caitlin Shea and I'm the events and media director for Walt Whitman Birthplace. And if you're not familiar with us yet, we are a museum that's located in Huntington, New York. And we hope that you can visit us in person. We are open right now uh, for a tour of the home that Walt Whitman was born in 201 years ago, almost 202 years ago. Uh, next month we'll be celebrating Walt Whitman's 202nd birthday. And I also am really happy to announce we're having a new type of birthday celebration for Whitman because we've been having so much success with these virtual events. We wanna continue that uh, and invite you, invite everyone to submit a video of you reading uh, any part of Leaves of Grass, a one to two minute video. Um, and during our live broadcast of this event, we'll be sharing all those videos. So it'll be really beautiful. We hope that you submit for that. Uh, I'm gonna be putting all these links in the chat. And if this is your first time joining us, we have so many virtual events, um, so many more this month uh, actually. So we're very excited for that. And we want you to join us. We have poetry events, especially because it's poetry month this month. And we also have scholarly events just like this. And another event that we have coming up is the Jackson Pollock Lee Krasner uh, studio tour. And we'll be partnering with the Jackson Pollock Lee Krasner Museum that's also located here on Long Island. So again, if you check out those links in the chat that I'll be posting, uh, you can find all the information for this and all of our events and you can pre-register just like you did for tonight. And I always wanna start every single Zoom event saying thank you so much to everyone who donates. It really means so much to us. Uh, these events have been growing and it's been just such a wonderful, meaningful experience for a whole year now, actually. And it means multitudes to us. So even something small like $5 that you might spend on a cup of Starbucks coffee, for us just means so much, especially when you multiply it by all the new people that we've been meeting. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for your presence as well. It really means so much to us. One second, I'm just gonna stop my screen share. There we go. All right. Okay. So now I'm gonna hand things over to our executive director, Cynthia Shore. We're so happy to have her with us here tonight and she'll be introducing our wonderful speakers. All right. So okay. Thank you, Caitlin. I think, uh, first of all, we all should give a round of applause, even if we're on mute, for Caitlin and the wonderful job she does. Thank you uh, pulling us through this pandemic with these wonderful Zooms. So wonderful, wonderful, Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Cynthia Shore, the Executive Director of the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Board of Trustees, of course, who support everything that we do in a marvelous way. And I welcome our guests tonight, David S. Reynolds and Barbara Baer. Let's have a round of applause and welcome to them. Um, I would like to give a shout out to our sponsors and supporters through their wonderful grants. Uh, New York State Office of Parks and Recreation, Suffolk County, who does a wonderful job of supporting us, the town of Huntington, and uh, the Humanities New York and New York State Council for the Arts. We're grateful for the wonderful federal, state, local, and support from you in the audience that keeps our uh, tubes going and keeps our programs coming. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're delighted to present tonight, Oh Captain, My Captain, and this is a discussion about Abraham Lincoln, his life and times, and Walt Whitman's poetry and speeches following Lincoln's untimely passing on April 15th, which of course is today. In 1865, President Abraham Lincoln succumbed to his injuries after being assassinated by well-known stage actor John Wilkes Booth. And upon hearing firsthand account of the assassination, Walt Whitman immediately sat down and penned a poetic elegy to the fallen leader, O oh, Captain, My Captain. It is now one of America's most favorite poems, and our speakers tonight, I'm sure, will be referring to it, interpreting it, and explicating it, all that we can say about Lincoln and Whitman. 
Whitman greatly admired the president, writing in October 1863, I love the president personally, he wrote, and he later declared that, quote, Lincoln gets almost nearer me than anybody else. And this fact is from Jerome Loving in his book, Walt Whitman, The Song of Himself. So there is a personal connection to Lincoln. And again, I'm sure our speakers will expound on this. So let me uh, introduce uh, David first, and David will offer his presentation. And then I will come back and introduce Barbara for her presentation. Uh, I say hello to our speakers and to all our friends across the nation. As we were talking beforehand, it's so wonderful to have the Zooms so that many people can join us who normally would not. So if there is a silver lining to this, uh, it certainly is to have you in the audience with us tonight. So thank you for joining us. Now I would like to introduce uh, David S. Reynolds. David S. Reynolds is a distinguished professor of American literature and U.S. history at the, at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is the author or editor of 16 books, including his current biography, Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times, that he will be talking about and presenting tonight. Uh, the book is the winner of this year's Lincoln Prize and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Book Award. Abe was among the Wall Street Journal's top 10 books of the year and also on the top book list of the Washington Post, the Christian Science Monitor, Kirkus Reviews. Reynolds' previous books include Walt Whitman's America, A Cultural Biography, winner of the Bancroft Prize and the Ambassador Book Award and his other book, one of many, Beneath the American Renaissance, winner of the Christian Gauss Award. He is a regular reviewer for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times Book Review, and the New York Review of Books. So I'm sure you may have seen his name there. Uh, he did have uh, the New York Review of Books, a review of his own book. Uh, and it's coming out on April 29th, but I was lucky to be tipped to this and the title of the review in the uh, New York Review of Books is Lincoln's Rowdy America. And I quote, and we will lead into David's speech with this, David Reynolds' new biography captures the cultural jumble of great literature, dirty jokes, and everything in between that went into the self-making of the foremost self-made American, Abraham Lincoln. I welcome David as a longtime friend and supporter who was here in our 2019 Whitman celebration, uh, gracing our Whitman stage. And now we have him again on our Zoom stage. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia and Caitlin. Uh, it's just great to be here again. Not in person this time, but uh, I'm reaching you know, a lot of people and uh, thank you for showing up today. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the reviewers said it right uh, in, in terms of the range of cultural vision of uh, Lincoln. And was it as broad as Walt Whitman's? No, I don't think so. Uh, however, there were some continuities between Whitman and Lincoln because um, neither of them had much schooling. Um, Lincoln had less than one year of school. He was raised on the frontier in Kentucky. And, you know, three months here, three months there, and so forth, and they were moving around. And, and yet he was extremely curious. And he's a good lesson, uh, as is Walt Whitman, uh, because of his family situation. Uh, you know, the family needed him to work. So at age 11, I think around fifth grade or something, that, that was the end of his schooling. And yet Whitman in his poet, poetry uses more um, different vocabulary words than any other poet, except for Shakespeare, uh, any, any other poet in, in English. Because, why? Because he was curious uh, about, about the world around him. And Lincoln was very, very much the same way. Um, Lincoln loved poetry. Um, the reason he liked poetry was that poetry is the most resonant and concentrated and kind of expressive 
form of language. It concentrates emotion and feeling. And you get this when you, when you read Walt Whitman. And even though uh, Lincoln himself wasn't a poet, he, he did publish a few poems, which were not bad. But in a sense, his best um, speeches are kind of prose poems because when you think of the Gettysburg Address, it's only 272 words, and yet it concentrates so much of American experience and the meaning of America that it has become recognized as our greatest speech. And perhaps our second greatest speech, um, the second inaugural of Lincoln, uh, that's only a little over 700 words and they're both short enough that they go on the walls of the Lincoln Memorial. If you ever visit the Lincoln Memorial in Washington with the columns and Lincoln is inscribed on the walls are the two greatest speeches probably. Uh, I mean, you could put Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and so forth. You know, there, there are other wonderful speeches but certainly two of the greatest speeches uh, ever uttered by an American. And it kind of reflects his interest in, in language. And every time we um, have a presidential campaign, you, you often hear uh, certain phrases uh, by Lincoln, the better angels of our nature, of the people, by the people, and for the people, uh, malice toward none, uh, and so forth. And in the background, we always uh, think of four score and seven years ago. ago. I mean, there were just certain um, ways in which Lincoln captured meaning, the meaning of America in, langu in language. And it's that kind of approach to Lincoln that I have. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was his contemporary, Emerson, of course, inspired Walt Whitman. <clears throat> Uh, Whit Whitman once said I was simmering and simmering and Emerson brought me to a boil because as a carpenter, um, Whitman would carry Emerson in his lunch pail and he started reading those essays and had this explosion of, of uh, insight and feeling. Anyway, but Emerson said about Lincoln, no other great hero in American history uh, covers the entire range of culture. From the very highest, Lincoln could recite Shakespeare by the page. How many people do we know can, let alone presidents, um, recite Shakespeare by the page? Uh, but you know, it's funny, when, when Lincoln did that, he didn't do, do it to sort of show off uh, as we might do at a cocktail party or something. He, he didn't drink or anything, didn't, didn't like cocktail parties and all that stuff. He, he only did that because these poems meant something to him. That's the only reason he did that. And he had a hard disc up here. I mean, he could read uh, a poem, not just Shakespeare, but Bur he memorized so much of Burns and Longfellow and so forth. And on the very day that um, Lee surrendered to Grant, which was uh, April 9th, 1865, Lincoln was on a boat uh, going from City Point, Virginia, back up to Washington. And everyone in the boat was jumping up and down and said, uh, yay, you know, we won, we won. You know, this is great, this is great. And uh, uh, let's celebrate, let's celebrate. And all Lincoln wanted to do at that point, he didn't even want to, he, he just read, he said, let me read some, some speeches from Shakespeare, from Shakespeare. And they were speeches about death. They, they were kind of, they weren't very optimistic. They were about death, but he was meditating on the fact that nearly 800,000 people had, had died, had died in the civil war and he wanted that was his way of responding to the immense bloodbath that was uh, the Civil War. <clears throat> and a lot of people around, because he went on for a couple of hours with, with and 
I mean, today we would say mission accomplished. Mission accomplished, we won, we won. But he was much more reflective uh, than that. And I really admire that about him. Not that any of us can necessarily be that way, or maybe we, maybe we shouldn't, shouldn't have to be that way. But I think that Whitman, when he responded poetically by writing, oh, captain, my captain, wonderful poem. And when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, which Swinburne called the most sonorous nocturne ever, ever chanted, ever chanted in the church of the world. The most sonorous, it's such a beautiful, beautiful poem. And a couple of other poems, um, when this dust was a man, hush be the camps today. And it's funny that none of these poems mention Lincoln by name because for Whitman, Lincoln was almost beyond expressing him by name. Um, although he spent much of his later life, uh, to be sure, um, talking about the death of Abraham Lincoln because uh, he was asked so often to speak about Lincoln, to, to, to speak. And because he had seen Lincoln on the streets of Washington, Peter Doyle, his good friend was there at the assassination. Um, so yeah, uh, he was often, uh, and he had a lecture called, it was like his money lecture, <laughs> uh, the death of Abraham Lincoln. And the death, you know, uh, he made a very good point, Whitman did. He said, the death of eminent, really eminent heroic people, that's what really unifies a nation much more than even a constitution, than laws or anything, the really unifying. And, and in essence, Lincoln kind of remains for people of both uh, parties, I think, you know, for, for Republicans, for Democrats, uh, for red state, for blue state, he remains a unifying figure. And I think that Walt Whitman himself is also uh, a unifying figure. Um, Pope Jean Paul said, I know very little about uh, America, but I know that I love Walt Whitman. And that was the Pope's, uh, Pope who said that. So, and everyone from, from, from the Pope to Allen Ginsberg to the beat poets to, you can take almost any level of culture and people love Walt Whitman, just as they, uh, as many of them, most of them love uh, Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to give just a brief little run through of a PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, if I can just go ahead and uh, put this up here. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, this is the book, it came out in, uh, came out in um, September. It'll, it'll be out in paperback, uh, I think early October or, or September. And it's done pretty well. It got a lot of reviews and looks like it's coming out as a documentary um, on a streaming, streaming service. I'm, I'm not allowed to sort of give details about that. But anyway, uh, it'll be coming out as that. And uh, so that should be kind of fun. And basically what I do is I, uh, you know, I, I uh, place uh, Lincoln in his cultural context. Uh, why? Well, you know, I think that we're all shaped by our culture, our family culture, our church culture, our school culture, our neighborhood, and then how all of that intersects with the larger culture. Uh, and it's that kind of Lincoln it's kind of like when I wrote Walt Whitman's America. Uh, Whitman had never been fully placed in his culture and Lincoln had never been placed fully in his culture. And yet, as Emerson says, culture is the air around us that we're absorbing every day. We breathe in that culture. And if you really wanted to understand us, you would go, any individual of us, we would go into that culture both our local culture and then the way the local culture intersects with, you see, intersects with 
the larger culture, uh, certain elements of, of uh, the larger culture. So that, that, that's basically what I'm uh, interested in doing. Uh, I'm trying to go forward here. It's funny that, uh, hang on. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, let me see. I was going to say that part of the culture was the Beecher family. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe is on the bottom row, sitting on the right side of your screen there, and behind her is Henry Ward Beecher. The reason I mention them is that, like Lincoln, they hated slavery, and there were so many so many different ways of combating slavery. And she used a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin, and which sold over a million copies the first year and just was an immense bestseller. And the reason it sold so well is it showed that enslaved people were, were people, were hum, human beings. They weren't, they weren't just beasts, animals to be chained and whipped. Uh, they had feelings, they had families, they loved, they cried, they laughed. And that's basically, that's, if you want to reduce it, that's why Uncle Tom's Cabin sold so well. And it was kind of a new thing to, to say. It seems obvious, but it was kind of, kind of a, a new thing. Henry Ward Beecher sitting behind her, to her left, to our right. He was a preacher who was against slavery. And he used the sermon. He was very, very good preacher, excellent preacher. And he uh, was a very prominent uh, anti-slavery speaker. John Brown took another, um, I wrote a, a book on John Brown as well. He was an abolitionist who hated slavery. However, he took a different tactic. Um, he took up arms against slavery before the Civil War and he raided Harper's Fer Ferry, Virginia uh, with 19 followers, five of them African-Americans trying to st uh, start a slave rebellion that he hoped would then spark an entire explosion in the South and dislodge slavery as a result. Didn't work out that way. He was captured at Harper's Ferry. He and five others were hanged. Um, they were brought to, to trial and, and they were hanged. But he became a kind of martyr, a martyr in the North and he became uh, quite beloved by many Northerners. Of course, he was despised uh, in the South, but he became known as, you know, Frederick Douglass said, I could live for people of my race. John Brown died. He died for people of my race. He died for people. Of my race. So uh, with all his kind of, um, you might call it craziness, or I don't like to call him crazy, but he was certainly what would be called monomaniacal. I think maybe obsessive, he, he was obsessive. Well, all of that, he was certainly at the very least devoted, um, devoted to um, uh, getting rid of slavery. Other uh, people of that era, William Lloyd Garrison. The difference between Garrison and Douglas, who's uh, on your right, Garrison interpreted the constitution to be pro-slavery and so he burned the constitution in public and he called it a covenant with death and hell. And he really wanted disunion. He, disunion meaning separation between the North and the South. Let the South go its own way. The North will be a place where fugitive people can come from slavery and escape to the North and then go to Canada. But he was very much against the constitution. Frederick Douglass broke with Garrison. They were initially allies because Douglass, like Lincoln actually, read the Constitution as fundamentally anti-slavery despite it's apparently pro, it never uses the word slavery, but with the three-fifths clause and with the fugitive slave clause, never uses the word slave, but still those were concessions to the South. And so that it could appear to be uh, pro-slavery, but Douglas said, no, it's fundamentally a human rights document. So uh, he and Garrison broke over that and here are some other writers of the figure uh, of the uh, period. Melville on your upper left, Emily Dickinson, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Hawthorne on your right top, uh, Emerson on your bottom left, Whitman in the middle, and uh, 
Henry David Thoreau, such a great period, a, such a great literary period. And these people in many ways were responding to slavery by doing it through literary works. Um, and Whitman himself um, was the first poet who in a poem, the 1855 Leaves of Grass, portrays African-Americans, uh, enslaved people with real compassion. He, uh, the first one, well, John Greenleaf Whittier had done that too, but the intensity of feeling uh, for the fugitive slaves in um, Song of Myself, where uh, Whitman says, I become the hounded slave. The I feel the whips and the, uh, 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 I, uh, the dogs are chasing me. And he, he literally becomes the enslaved person who's, who's seeking freedom. It's really remarkable. And then in I Sing the Body Electric, he says, you know, I am the man or the woman at auction. Being you know, Enslaved people were sold at auction like animals. But he said, inside the same red blood is running and the same muscles that you or I have are running. And he really uh, empathizes uh, with, with uh, uh, black people in that poem. And um, he really hoped that his poem would, it was so democratic that he hoped it would be absorbed by uh, his country. And he even says in the 1855 edition, he says, you know, the poets will be the presidents. The poets will absorb America and they would transform America. Unfortunately, um, the first edition didn't, it was, you know, a thousand copies were printed, but he literally had to give a lot of them away. They, they, they just didn't sell very well. And at that point he says, well, I, he continued to write poetry for the rest of his life. So he, he never gave up poetry at all, but he realized that uh, politics would have to do it in terms of getting rid of slavery. And so the next year, 1856, he was looking around and he saw James Buchanan, James Buchanan Franklin Pierce, these really bad, pres bad, bad presidents. And he said, I'd be much pleased to see some heroic, shrewd, fully informed, healthy bodied, middle-aged, beard-faced American blacksmith or boatman come down from the West across the Alleghenies and walk into the presidency. And at the time, uh, Lincoln was not known. He was, not, he was an unknown politician. And, it's kind of amazing that uh, this was almost a job description because at the time, Illinois was considered the West. Well, that's where Lincoln was from. So uh, four years later, here comes Abe. This is why I call my book Abe is that um, he didn't like the name Abe. Lincoln, Lincoln liked to be called Lincoln, just Lincoln. Didn't even like to be called Mr. President or Abraham or anything, just like Lincoln. Didn't like Abe, but but he said I couldn't have been elected elected uh, if it weren't for the name Abe. That's how everybody knows me. The masses loved him as Abe, and this is how he was sold. Someone he did used to split rails uh, when he was younger, and he used to build fences. And he was he, he was raised in the frontier, so yeah, he you know. And he was, he was a boat, boatman on the Mississippi and all that. But it had been about 23 years. You know, he had been a lawyer for 23 years. So he wasn't really Abe in this sense of the word. But again, he said, okay, Abe, honest old Abe, uh, and so forth. This is uh, how I am. This is actually how he looked uh, at the time. He didn't have a beard yet. He grew a beard at the behest of a 11 year old girl who named Grace Bedell and she wrote him saying, Mr. Lincoln, I think you would look a little better with the whiskers, with the whiskers. So <laughs> he, uh, he grew, grew a beard uh, a little bit after this. And uh, <laughs> when he was going back East, um, he was going up near Rochester where uh, Grace lived. And by that time she was 12 and said, is a young girl named Grace Bedell here? And she was there and she came up and said, Thank you for your letter. And as you can see, I'm growing some whiskers. So thank you for your suggestion. So <laughs> that was kind of funny, but uh, this is the way he really looked. Now, in his day, 
the Republican Party was considered dangerously radical. Why? It was anti-slavery and it was considered friendly to all these isms. Isms were things like socialism, mesmerism, uh, spiritualism, spirit rapping, free love, uh, the temperance movement, women's rights, and so forth. And it is true that, oh, nativism, and so forth. It is true that to some degree, well, certainly, for example, all the women's rights people voted for Lincoln, and most of the temperance people did vote for Lincoln, and certainly the anti-slavery movement uh, was for Lincoln. But from the perspective of the South, as I show in my book, uh, all of these supposedly evil, bad, radical, dangerous things were rooted in New England Puritanism. That's why at the very base of that altar, this is an altar, supposedly a religious altar that the North has erected. It's just a cartoon, obviously. It's a caricature. But the base is Puritanism. That's where all the bad things come from. And then you have, oh, socialism, free love, and then supposedly Negro worship. And then above that, a phrase, there is a, a white man who's being sacrificed by Henry Ward Beecher, no, by Charles Sumner with a knife, sacrificed to the God of the African-American who's sitting above on top of the altar. Uh, so the idea is that white people are being sacrificed for, so that African-American people can rule the nation. And isn't this horrible and how terrible? And then there's a statue of John Brown with his spear to the left of the African-American there. Uh, and the African-American has a spear behind him because he's gonna go out and kill all the white people. This was the vision. And Lincoln is there uh, kind of in the middle, uh, right there below the African-American. This is the vision of um, the Republican party. I mean, today we, we make caricatures of, of the other party and so forth. And th this is the vision that uh, the Democrats and particularly the Southern Democrats had of the Republicans and of, and of Lincoln. This is one reason why Lincoln, when Lincoln is elected automatically, 11 states have to leave. They, they, they just have, they can't put up with this malarkey, right? I'm talking from their, pers their perspective, not, not my perspective, obviously. Uh, and here's another, and here he's being carried by Horace Greeley, who was a Republican into the lunatic asylum He's followed by all the isms, the women's rights, the free love. And there's an African-American there who says, the white man has no rights that colored people are bound to respect. I want that understood. And you know, this, the Republicans were viewed as the revolutionaries, the bad guys. And there's someone who talks about here, a socialist takeover of the government. And Lincoln is there on the rail being carried into the crazy house the lunatic asylum, that's what they called it back then. We would never call anything uh, remotely like that today. That, that's the phrase they, they used back then. And Lincoln turns to all the isms people and he says, now my friends, I'm almost in and the millennium is gonna begin. So ask what you will and it shall be granted. So all these people are asking for total revolution, you see. But now you know why the Southern states seceded. This is the way they view viewed Abraham Lincoln. Whereas the Southerners viewed themselves as very stable, very conservative. The black people were where they should be. I'm talking about from the Southern perspective down there and the white people are up top and everything is calm and you don't have all this crazy revolution going on. Um, and this is Lincoln again. And, you know, Lincoln had to be careful because in the North, there were a lot of and there were a lot of very conservative people, very very conservative people. They were called Copperheads, and they sympathized with the South. So even though he was radically anti-slavery, and end, ended up by being radically pro-African American, he had to walk a tightrope. And uh, the most famous tightrope walker was Charles Blondin, who went back and forth across Niagara Falls without a net. He went forward, he went backward, he went at night. He went on five foot stilts. He went with a man on his back. 
he went pushing a wheelbarrow. And uh, Lincoln was, I can't imagine doing that, you know, particularly being the man on his back, my God. Anyway, uh, and Lincoln compared himself several times to Blondin. He said, look, if I was Blondin pushing my, my wheelbarrow across Niagara and I had all of America and its future in my wheelbarrow, would you tell me to, you know, throw my body to the left, too far to the left or too far to the right? No, you would allow me to stay right where I am in the middle and apply to the Civil War. He said, look, if we lose one of the border states like, uh, Colum uh, like uh, Kentucky uh, or Maryland, these were slave states, but they were still in the Union. If we lose one of those, we're gonna lose everything. I have to be Blondin. I have to be Blondin. And that's why he was portrayed so often in the cartoons as Blondin Lincoln, precariously poised. And that's why he comes across today to some people as being somewhat conservative, conservative or moderate. He just sort of had to be that way to keep the nation alive. Um, he was supported by the young America of the day, the Bahois. Walt Whitman, the first three re reviews, uh, call Whitman the Bahoy poet. The Bahoy was the working class young man with his gahal. These were working class figures who were just the average American, average working. And the Bahoys really came together around Lincoln. They formed the Wide Awakes, the Wide Awakes, and they dressed up at night and they carried their torches and you can see them there. And that's why uh, uh, it was thought that young America uh, would be elected, Lincoln would be elected, young America would, would win. Uh, and he did win the ballot box. He was supported by, by the Bahois and by uh, young America. And he was swept into office. Unfortunately, 11 Southern states left the union. So he was faced with confronting them and, and pursuing war against them. During the war, he depended on popular culture. This guy, Petroleum Nasby, David Ross Locke, he loved Lincoln, loved and thought he was like the greatest man who ever lived, Lincoln. And yet he impersonated someone who was opposed to Lincoln, this drunken, ignorant, stupid, copperhead Democrat, Petroleum Nasby, who uses the N-word so much it's ridiculous. I mean, but that's what Lincoln's opponents were doing. They were just totally racist. And so Petroleum Nasby was not really what the way David Ross Locke felt. It was like beyond Saturday Night Live or anything like that. I mean, it was really a caricature of the opponents of Lincoln. And it had such effect that a lot of people said Petroleum Nasby was responsible for the victory of the North. He had such a great effect and Lincoln loved him. He, he thought, Lincoln said once, I'd like to swap places with him, you know, and he, he loved uh, to read Nasby. And here's uh, John Wilkes Booth, who's on the left side of the right picture there with his brothers. His father was a very intense method actor. Uh, and Booth, uh, there were so many people who wanted to assassinate Lincoln, and Lincoln had a whole stash of assassination letters. But Booth carried through with it because he exercise what I call the American style of acting, which was very intense and getting totally involved in the role. I mean, and when he killed Lincoln in a theater, he told someone at his hotel that evening, he said, there's gonna be some great acting tonight. He really felt he was acting a role and killing a tyrant. He was a complete white supremacist. And he was like Petroleum Nasby in person. He was Petroleum Nasby, although he was the, he was like the best looking man in America. I mean, he was like Brad Pitt uh, and every, all the ladies loved him, but, but he detested Lincoln and he thought he was playing a, a great role. And actually the, the African-Americans who met uh, Lincoln found him to be very unracist uh, in person, uh, extremely um, unprejudiced. And here's Frederick Douglass saying that um, he was the first uh, a president who really respected the rights of the black man. Here's Martin Delaney, who is beyond Black Lives Matter. Uh, I mean, he was just, just such a radical and yet he loved Lincoln and wanted to construct a statue of Lincoln. And it was gonna be an Afri African woman crying four million tears 
It was going to be paid for by all the enslaved people who were now free, a penny from each of them. That statue wasn't, uh, wasn't um, built, but another statue that was totally funded by African Americans was the one on your right there. And unfortunately, now it's considered racist and it was torn down in Boston. And they're probably going to tear it down in, um, in Washington. It's con considered racist. It, it, it was considered by, by the Black people. It was, it was totally funded by, by African Americans. And it was considered a tribute to Lincoln. And you see the uh, uh, Black person there. Yes, he's on a lower level than Lincoln, but he's breaking his chains. And that was the big deal that the chains have been broken and now he's almost ready to sprint. He almost look, looks like he's at the starting block and ready to sprint. So uh, anyway, that's the end of my show. Enough said from me. Um, just a little taste uh, of, my, um, of my book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Oh my goodness. Everyone was just completely enthralled in this discussion. Absolutely. I saw lots of note taking and smiling and nodding. Oh, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, if everyone wants to unmute just for a moment, we can give a big round of applause for David S. Reynolds. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not everyone knows this, but this was a bit last minute planned. Uh, we wanted it to be April 15th. So David and Barbara thankfully agreed uh, to jump in there and get this happening with us. So we are thankful for that too. All right. So unfortunately, uh, our executive director, Cynthia Shore, disconnected during this. And I know she's going to be disappointed. But uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Barbara Bear, who I've had the pleasure to introduce many times because she's been with us many times in person and also here on Zoom. So it's so great to have you back, Barbara. And you always have these fascinating topics uh, that you know you plan these things, and they just you know there's so many wonderful archival items that you can show us relating to them. And Barbara Bear is a curator for literature, culture, and arts in the manuscript division at the Library of Congress and a specialist for digital humanities projects, a member of the organizing committee for the 2019 Washington DC Whitman 200 Festival. Barbara was lead curator for the Whitman Bicentennial Exhibit and Walt Whitman Open House public display featuring Whitman materials from throughout the library's collections. Along with the poetry program at the Folger Library, the open house served as the finale for the citywide celebration of Whitman's birth. And yes, that 200th birthday was a great big event all around, the, all around here in the US, but also the world. It was magnificent. And we're coming up to the 202nd. All right, Barbara, I'm going to hand you over the spotlight right now. Thank okay. You so thank you so much, Caitlin. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen. And I also have a little PowerPoint. And I'll start from the beginning here. Okay. So I'm going to focus tonight on Walt Whitman's Death of Lincoln speech, which David mentioned earlier, and share with you some collection items that are related to it that are from the Library of Congress, either from the Manuscript Division or the Prints and Photographs Division. So let's start with Whitman's own words and explanation about the speech. How often since that dark and dripping Saturday, that chilly April day, now 15 years bygone, my heart has entertained the dream, the wish, to give of Abraham Lincoln's death its own special thought and memorial. My talk here indeed is less because of itself or anything in it, and nearly altogether because I feel a desire, apart from any talk, to specify the day, the martyrdom. For my own part, I hope and desire till my own dying day whenever the 14th or 15th of April comes to annually gather a few friends and hold its tragic reminiscence. So thank you for gathering these friends here tonight. Um, 
Walt Whitman gave his Death of Lincoln lecture for the first time in New York City on April 14th, 1879. Again in Philadelphia, April 15th, 1880. And again in Boston on April 15th, 1881. The Death of Lincoln speech is a work of art in many ways. It is multi-layered, constructed as a text within a text and a play within a play. And its performance was its own kind of dramatic entertainment. Whitman gave the lecture sporadically in different cities and to different types of audiences at least 10 times that we know of, most often in the lilac laden months of April or May until 1890. Over the years of repetition and reading, the speech reinforced the memory of Lincoln and also the reputation of Whitman as a poet of democracy. One 1887 promoter proclaimed that, quote, the lecture is a prose poem and is now regarded as a classic. Whitman sometimes had a hand in publishing news of the event that appeared in the local papers. The back of the clipping from Boston in 1881 shows the popularity at the time of elocution lessons generally, often taught by women in an era when school children regularly recited poems. Whitman crafted the Death of Lincoln lecture in remembrance of the president, but also as he noted explicitly in his reading copy of the speech for all the wartime dead, soldier and civilian. In notes Whitman made for himself, he drafted ideas for the address in relation to his Civil War poetry. And he asked the rhetorical question, what grand orators of the time were memorializing the green mounds of mass graves of dead soldiers? He also touched on the speech on the prelude to the war, saying we cannot have too many reminiscences of the secession war and things that led to it. The Lincoln Lecture is at the heart of the newest offering in the Library of Congress by the People Crowdsourcing Transcription Walt Whitman Campaign, focused on the speeches portion of the Charles E. Feinberg collection of Walt Whitman papers. The name by the people as David brought up earlier, comes from the Gettysburg Address. The Whitman Speeches Project just launched on April 1st with the work of over 100 volunteer transcribers. It quickly met the challenge goal of completion before Walt Whitman's May birthday. And indeed, um, by today's anniversary of Lincoln's death and of Whitman's famous speech. Just as there had been a prelude to the war, there was a long prelude to Whitman becoming an orator. Whitman as a young man had a strong interest in wordsmithing and rhetoric. He aspired in the period when he was first writing Leaves of Grass to become a lecturer himself. His mother, Louisa, with whom he was close, was a storyteller. He later said he had learned to craft a narrative at her knee. During the heyday of the Lyceum movement, he heard orators and speakers and attended local debates. Ralph Waldo Emerson's lectures and the resulting essays on transcendentalism profoundly framed Whitman's thinking in the formative years of Leith's grass. And of course, Emerson himself became a mentor. An ardent Democrat who came from similar slaveholding Dutch New York roots as Martin Van Buren, Whitman as a young Long Island school teacher and fledgling reporter and newspaper man followed Whig and democratic politics. He attended local debates and wrote and edited political coverage in the newspaper. As the anti-slavery and abolition movements gained strength and produced their own form of powerful oratory in the figures of William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth and others, Whitman wrestled separately with the slavery question and racial rights, as did the rest of the nation. His views in that quarter evolved over time, as did his opinion of Abraham Lincoln. 
as is so well described in the beautiful chapter on Whitman influences in David's early cultural biography, Walt Whitman's America. Whitman's forms of expression were also shaped by the theater and music performances that he attended in Manhattan and his appreciation of the great Shakespearean actors and opera singers of his day, including Junius Brutus Booth, the father of actors Edwin Booth and John Wilkes Booth. The latter, well known in Washington in the 1860s, and as David just mentioned, a matinee idol for many young girls who was the Brad Pitt of his day, would become the instrument of Lincoln's death. As we know, Abraham Lincoln's own political rise was based on his gifts in oral tradition. In his short piece, A Lincoln Reminiscence, Whitman said, quote, storytelling was often with President Lincoln, a weapon which he employed with great skill. Master of the Cracker Barrel story, as a country store proprietor, wielder of the turn of phrase and persuasive argument as a circuit lawyer, he famously appeared in the Lincoln-Douglas debates leading up to his selection as the Republican Party nominee for president. In an era of masterful oratory in the Congress and from the pulpit, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and Second Inaugural stand out as kingpins of 19th century oratory generally and of presidential speeches across time. David has devoted a wonderful chapter in the book, Abe, um, analyzing both speeches. Whitman and Lincoln also had in common, as David just mentioned, the rural beginnings and the love of language and American idioms and slang, as well as enjoyment of all levels of the performing arts. I'll go back. It was not until he was an old man that Whitman fulfilled the idea of himself as a speech maker and an orator or fully realized his goal for keeping the flame of Lincoln remembrance alive. Speaking engagements and the speaking tour were then as now ways that people with already established reputations made a living. In the last period of his life, when the poet was living in Camden, he was in an ill health and chronically in need of funds. He also remained a self-promoter who enjoyed a cadre of loyal followers. With encouragement from Samuel Clemens and others, he turned late in life in a limited way to the lecture circuit, adding the speech to the essay, the poem, and the periodical piece as one of his means of expression. Whitman's Lincoln Lecture follows an arc of tragedy that is both personal and political. In the speech and elsewhere in Whitman's writing, especially in When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, Lincoln's Good Friday death carried a sacrificial and redemptive Christ-like aura in its relation to the United States. Echoing the sentiment of the president's second inaugural address, Whitman saw Lincoln's death as penance for the sins of the nation that helped even the score of suffering between North and South and paved a way to reconciling a divided country. Whitman said so at the beginning of his speech, stating that Lincoln, quote, belongs to these states in their entirety, having led the North, but to, in his roots, originating from the South, and though grafted on the West, being essentially a Southern contribution. Whitman's 1879 to 1881 reading copy for the speech was a collage of pages he created using his memoranda during the war, combined with newly drafted handwritten passages and penned edits, cut and pasted into what was then the newly published edition of another poet's work, John Dunbar Highland Hilton's The Bride of Gettysburg, which came out in 1878. The speech incorporates whole passages from memoranda, which is in turn based on Whitman's Washington era notebooks and journalism. The material was further repurposed in Whitman's memoir, Specimen Days and Collect in 1882, in which the speech was printed along with Democratic Vistas, a Lincoln reminiscence and other selected pieces. 
In his preparatory notes, also in the Feinberg Whitman collection at the library, Whitman jotted ideas of the war as about the quote, fervent love of comrades, deep and adhesive. He studied the eighth section of the Odyssey regarding the divine bard who sings of the bloody war between the Greeks and the Trojans. He argued in his speech that Lincoln took highest place in his white male leadership or hero vision of history. He was indeed to Whitman, the pivotal figure of the 19th century. Whitman, meanwhile, gladly took on the role of the bard who carried on the story. In giving the speech, Whitman forever linked himself with Lincoln and reinforced his own continued celebrity and claim as poet for the nation. Read in combination with his famed Lincoln poem, O Captain, My Captain, which he recited at the end of the oration, and the elegy when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, both written in the wake of the assassination and first published in the sequel to his wartime collection of poetry, Drum Taps. The speech helped create a lasting spin about Lincoln and his significance in history. The speech built to dramatic crescendo and reportedly left audiences spellbound. Whitman began by describing the period before the war, followed through to the inauguration, the war itself, the, and the assassination, and concluded with the closing pronouncement of the monumental erasure of slavery from the states, and Lincoln termed as the great martyr chief. In the years leading to war, Whitman had feared most of all disunion, and he was skeptical of Lincoln's election to the presidency, but he came to be one of the Republican president's most ardent admirers. For Whitman, Lincoln was not so much the great emancipator as the commander in chief who had preserved the union. He was the great reuniter of white men north and south, previously so at odds with one another brothers who had fought at a war that Whitman in his speech and interestingly also John Dunbar Hilton in his Bride of Gettysburg called fratricidal. Whitman's remembrance of Lincoln and of the war itself was a wash in woundedness, but whose woundedness? The poet had little to say in the speech as to the horror and brutality of slavery itself or those who had lived under its lash for generations. He referred to secessionists and abolitionists in effect as rabble rousers, though he had counted supporters of John Brown among his associates. Nor did he mention in his speech the heroism and sacrifices of African-American soldiers, the heavy cross of racial violence, or the dashed prospects of freedmen in the new post-war republic. His primary concern was for the white working men he so loved, comrades North and South, whom he referred to as his quote, friends on both sides. The narrative of the death of Lincoln builds poignantly from an eyewitness account of the first time Whitman saw Lincoln in person. When he was a little boy, Whitman saw Lafayette in a celebratory way when the revolutionary hero visited New York, but this was something different. The adult poet was part of an ominous and brooding crowd that watched Lincoln make his way to Astor House as he stopped in New York in February, 1861 on his way from the West to his inauguration in Washington. Whitman describes a mass of 30 to 40,000 men, not a single one, Lincoln's personal friend. There were no speeches, Whitman says. The atmosphere instead was quietly hostile. Lincoln faced threats of violence and personal harm from the moment of his election from those who feared the racial equity and opposition to the expansion of slave territory his victory might mean. The mob crowd, Whitman said, was one where many an assassin's knife and pistol lurked in hip or breast pocket, ready soon as break and riot came. The image of that day, Whitman said, was indelibly stamped upon my recollection. The good look at Lincoln, 
It was one of many Whitman would repeat when both lived in Washington. The New York incident was in a way the beginning of Whitman's feelings of affinity and bromance born of detached observation of the Republican leader. Whitman used a different twist on audience perspective in his description of the night of Lincoln's murder. In delivering his lecture, he read from his published account of the assassination scene from memoranda during the war. He appears to be reporting as an eyewitness, but was actually using the description given to him by his significant other, Peter Doyle. Whitman was in New York preparing drum taps for press at the time of the shooting, but Doyle was at Ford's theater. Whitman reminds his lecture audience that the day, April 14th, 1865, seems to have been a pleasant one throughout the land. Early herbage, early flowers were out. There were many lilacs in full bloom and the enemy had just capitulated. The afternoon paper announced that the president and Mrs. Lincoln would be attending the theater. Whitman, the lover of the performing arts, is ever cognizant of the play within the play. He observes in his soliloquy to his own audience that Lincoln was, quote, the leading actor in the story drama known to a real history stage, end quote. Killed after watching a parlor scene in the piece, Our American Cousin, by a familiar theater actor who jumped on stage after firing the fatal shot and exited backstage as if it had been choreographed or rehearsed. Mary Lincoln cried out as her part in the real life play and, and at first oblivious and confused and then stunned audience broke into chaos. In that moment, Lincoln's career, Whitman observed, reached quote, its highest poetic single central pictorial denouement. Whitman said the murder of Lincoln was one of those, quote, climax moments on the stage of universal time. The subsequent funeral procession of Lincoln's casket through the country to Illinois drew yet another kind of mourning and ceremonial eyewitness crowd replayed in several cities along the pathway to Springfield. Whitman reached the apex of his own performance of Death of Lincoln at Madison Square Theater in New York on April 14, 1887. He delivered the lecture before a large audience, including leading philanthropists, artists, and literary figures, and he raised several hundred dollars. The attendees in 1887 included Cuban journalist and exiled writer Jose Marti, whose review published in Buenos Aires helped spread Whitman's reputation in Latin America. Marti himself became lauded as a martyr to Cuban independence from Spain and the subject matter of a memorial in Revolution Square in Havana, the site of frequent oratory by Cuban leader Fidel Castro. Whitman suffered another dis disabling stroke in 1888 and he delivered the Lincoln Lecture for the last time in Philadelphia in 1890. His Lincoln poems were part of the last deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, and his own death came in Camden, New Jersey on March 26, 1892. A webcast of an April 14, 2005 reenactment of the Death of Lincoln program, for which I served as the producer for the Library of Congress, with Daniel Mark Epstein reading the Lincoln Lecture is available on the library's website. You can also listen to what is reputed to be a rare wax cylinder recording of Whitman speaking aloud in 1889 or 1890, reciting lines from his poem, America. Thank you, Barbara. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful portrait of Whitman that you painted for us, an intimate portrait with his handwriting and everything and this part of his life that not many people know that much about. I see all our Whitmaniacs are smiling and beaming as you speak. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. You're welcome. 
All right, and I'm going to have everyone on mute again for just a moment so that we can give a big round of applause for Barbara Bear. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. Excellent. And now we're going to go to our Q&A portion of the program. Uh, and what you can do is you can just jump right on camera. Uh, I'm going to have you mute if you're not asking a question, though. Just remember to do that. Uh, but you can just start talking and I'll turn the video over to you and you can ask your questions to both David and Barbara. I know the pressure's on, so we'll give you a second. <laughs> and you can also ask in the chat, that's fine too. Uh, and then I can read the questions. Caitlin, I have a question. Okay, I'm great. Something. <laughs> Hi, Susan, one of our Hi. Board trustee. <laughs> um, for, for David Reynolds, um, the link between what you were talking about at the bottom of that, of those building blocks of the isms, the, the, um, the bottom one being Puritanism. I didn't get the connection between Puritanism and how that fed up to these other isms, if you would. Thanks for that great question. Um, <clears throat> you have to really read my book to understand it because um, I'm really the first one who ever, and I'm write, writing a book on that right now as well. So, but uh, another book, but um, basically the idea is that Puritanism from the perspective of Lincoln's era and Walt Whitman's era to many people appear, uh, appeared to be so anti-institutional. The Puritans had broken off from the Anglican church uh, a lot of them at the time were anti-Catholic and mainly anti-institutional. And they believed in the Bible, the relationship between the Bible and the individual. And yes, the preacher, but then not so much the church. And so it sprouted over time, a lot of prophets, um, eventually people like, uh, uh, you know, Joseph Smith came out of um, a form of uh, Protestant revivalism. It produced um, uh, a lot of, if you read my book, Waking Giant, just many, many sort of self-styled prophets. And that's why the word ego is at the top of that cartoon. I don't know if you, I don't know if you noticed, you know, the self. And uh, so the idea is that all these different interpretations of reality, spiritualism and, and women's rights, and they were all kind of fabricated out of this kind of individual and transcendentalism. Emerson was, you know, the apostle of self-reliance and all of that. And even Whitman, I sing myself uh, and all of that. So um, from the Southern perspective, it was uh, seen uh, Whitman's poetry appreciated by my women more than men. I mean, in his era, uh, women, truly appreciated his poet, uh, his poetry a lot. And if you read Walt Whitman's America, although he didn't really consider himself a suffragist or a women's rights person, but he says, I am the poet of, of woman as much as man. I am the poet of woman as much as man. And a woman should take pride in her physical being and as much as man and all of that. So uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the answer to that. But to get back to your thing, Puritanism was thought to unleash a kind of a lot of radical New England movements. And the South said, no, we're nice and secure. We have the high church, high church down here. We're nice. And the cornerstone of the Confederacy, the speech given by uh, Alexander Stevens said, we're the first society on earth that has ever had such a marvelous thing as slavery because it, it puts the races where they should be according to their established hierarchy. And isn't this just great, you know? But look at the North, I mean, the so-called Negro worship and all that stuff. You know? So, and a lot of that was um, rooted in, in Puritanism. It, it was largely a myth. It was, you know, we have cultural stereotypes, uh, but the Southerners cons were considered the Cavaliers and the North, uh, the Puritans had beheaded uh, the champion of the Cavaliers back in the English Civil Wars, they had beheaded uh, Charles I. 
and then Cromwell took over, who was a Puritan. But a lot of the Cavaliers who were Royalists, who were supporting Charles I, fled England and moved to Virginia. You see, so you had the, the uh, Cavalier versus the Virginia, and that, that's kind of how it, it all uh, started. Thank you, David. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Brian Wetters asks, does anyone know if Robert Lincoln attended or acknowledged Whitman's memorial of Abe Lincoln? Not sure, David or Barbara, if you ever heard anything. That's a very that. good question. And um, I, I, I don't believe that he did, but I don't know for a fact. Um, no, no, he, he, he didn't. Um, there was only one, and, and Mary didn't either. Um, uh, no, nobody did, except for a, a distant cousin of, of, of Lincoln. So Mary, Mary was too devastated. Robert was, uh, the whole family was devastated. Tad stayed uh, back in the White House with uh, Mary. Uh, Robert, uh, you know, stayed back East and uh, everyone was uh, thoroughly, and Willie was in the train, uh, his corpse. Uh, he had died and they exhumed his corpse and put it in the train with the corpse of his father so that Willie could be buried there in Illinois. But uh, yeah. Wow. Well, just to, to mention about Robert Lincoln in terms of eyewitness that he was the, you know, the member of the family that was in Springfield um, at the internment. Isn't that right, David? That um, to, to, uh, Mary was too devastated. She was still with Tad, so Robert was the one that represented the family. Yeah, right. And the question uh, just was uh, uh, arisen, uh, where was Willie buried? Uh, he was originally buried in a, um, a crypt uh, cemetery in uh, George, Georgetown. And uh, with the understanding that yes, eventually they didn't know. They they've they they planned eventually to to move him to Springfield, where the family was from. And uh, now you can uh, now now Willie is there and Tad is there and Mary is there along with Abe, uh, just outside of Springfield, part of Springfield in, in a, a cemetery there. Um, however, Robert, who actually became uh, you know served in the army, uh, is uh, and and also became a government official later on. Um, is in Arlington National uh, Cemetery, so he's uh, he's not he's not buried with with the family. I just wanted to add on that topic. Um, I'm sure many of the people um, tonight have already read it, but um, George Saunders' Lincoln and the Bardo is a wonderful book about uh, the way that Lincoln mourned Willie and even visited um, the the. The mausoleum area in the Georgetown Cemetery where he was buried, and it's a work of fiction, but um, it deals um, with you know historical accounts um, that it's based on. So, it's a beautiful book to read in combination to thinking about the Lincoln funeral procession and the final burial of Willie and um, Lincoln, um, basically going together. Wonderful. Um, we have a comment from John Davidson, who's actually joining us from France. Nice to have you, John. I know you're having issues connecting, but you made it. Um, and we kind of went over this while we were talking, but uh, he was saying, is women's poetry appreciated more by women than by men? I think equally now, <laughs> I would say. And let's see, does anyone else want to jump on camera and ask any of their questions? Let's see if we have anything else in the chat. I have a question. Yes, one second. I have a question for uh, for David Reynolds, uh, whose books I very much enjoy. Uh, in reading them, it has occurred to me that on the issue, a, a great 19th century issue, uh, a Thomas Carlyle's uh, great man theory of, of uh, history, uh, and versus uh, Leo Tolstoy's uh, essay at the end of War and Peace, in which uh, Tolstoy seems to me to be arguing that 
uh, great men do not drive history. It is uh, the, the, the rise of, of individuals, male and female, out of a culture. And it seems to me that, uh, uh, that you'd be very much in uh, Count Tolstoy's camp, but I, I would like to hear you, uh, what, what you might have to say about that. Yeah, um, it's kind of a both and situation because Lincoln himself uh, at times said, I don't control events, they control me. And he also said, conditions make the man. We, we would say conditions make the human being. At the same time, he was a big believer in individual effort and the idea that the individual can shape, uh, can shape uh, events. And he's kind of a living example of someone who was profoundly influenced in, and also absorbing his contemporary culture. So in a sense, he was produced by it. But then he had enough sense of his self and his own ability. And uh, I think also it helped that he was a lawyer. He tried over 5,100 cases. And so he learned how to use the cerebral cortex, the, the rational mind to kind of shape things. Uh, he was very aware of the power of language. So. Uh, I, it, it, for him, it was certainly a, a combination of uh, the power of the individual and, uh, um, and the conditions. He realized that there were some things that he couldn't change. Um, the Battle of Antietam, um, the North won probably by pure chance because uh, one of uh, McClellan's uh, orderlies happened to trip upon three cigars, and the cigars uh, were wrapped in the uh, in, in in the battle plans of Robert E. Lee. So, uh, and as it was, the North just barely won that battle. And maybe if you know, there's a, there's a situation of you know ridiculous chance just kind of you know uh, stopping a conceivable victory of the South at that point, because if Robert E. Lee then breaks through Antietam and proceeds North, uh, who knows what was gonna happen at that point. So yeah, I mean, there, there's an example of just events, some weird event that was just uh, you know, very chance. So Lincoln was, was aware of both, of both of those things. Thank you very much. I, 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 uh, I appreciate you very much, your, your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just chime in to say that, you know, for Whitman, it was some of both that, you know, certainly he painted Lincoln as a hero. He wrote about Carlisle, Thomas Paine, um, but also he was the great um, poet who celebrated the common man or, you know, uh, the great diversity of culture and of people of all types making up the nation. So we have some of both coming from um, Whitman. And David, I just wanted to mention that one of the parts of uh, your book, Abe, that I really enjoyed was your analysis of the personality of John Wilkes Booth and his interest in um, John Brown. So it seemed appropriate to this question about the, the role of the individual um, in history and what Booth particularly admired about John Brown. Yeah, and uh, the thing about John Brown, of course, is that he he felt exactly opposite in his political views to Booth because Booth was a complete white, white supremacist, and you know uh, he believed Af African Americans should be enslaved enslaved people. Um, John Brown uh, gave his life to to free the slaves, and yet Booth was at the hanging, and he was just amazed looking up at John Brown, how John Brown, and a lot of Southerners said much better things about John Brown than Northerners because Southerners had this big thing about honor, you know, manliness. And John Brown was the coolest person around on the scaffold. He just, he was calmer than anybody. He says, you know, hang, hang me, go ahead. Uh, and so um, Booth called him the grandest man of the, of the century, the grandest man, as much as he hated what John Brown stood for, he was the grandest man. And so I argue in my book that at least in, in part, Booth wanted to be John Brown in reverse. He wanted to change history 
as an individual, you know, so, yeah. Great questions. Do we have any other questions? Does anyone want to come on camera? Give everyone a moment. All right. I, I, just, I, I just have a thought. Um, it, it's just a little uncanny how much um, time Whitman spent um, going around and delivering his performance about the death of Lincoln. And one just has to wonder if Lincoln had never been assassinated, what would Whitman have been, this is just to you know, throw out a question, what would Whitman have been doing all those years <laughs> in doing other kinds of you know, speeches, performances, um, you know, almost, he, it was almost like he was perseverating about, about the death of Lincoln, the death of Lincoln, you know, and, and just one wonders. Well, he was also extremely productive in those, in you know, the period. We, we tend to think, well, by the time that he left Washington, D.C., after he had his stroke and he moved to Camden, um, that, that was sort of a fallow period for Whitman, but it wasn't. He was busy, busy producing. He produced memoranda during the war, the Specimen Days, November Browse, two, two Revelettes. I mean, he was really writing a lot of prose and poetry at the same time. And the speeches were kind of a sideline, really. But it's a good question. Um, you know, would he have done some other kind of oratory about something else if there wasn't Lincoln to speak of? Would he have been um, doing more of what he was saying in his notes to himself about, uh, you know, where are the speeches that are the tributes to the mounds of dead men um, and talking more about the soldiers and, as opposed to Lincoln as the hero of the nation. So maybe that would have been different. It's interesting that when he publishes November Bows, it has a piece on Lincoln in it. And one of the questions that Whitman asks himself is, you know, what would have happened if, if Lincoln had lived? How would have things been different? Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, and, uh, What's funny is that he gave that speech so often, uh, as Barbara was saying, and he had to recite O oh, Captain so often that finally he said, damn my captain, you know, he <laughs> had to recite it time and time again. I mean, obviously, it's a great, great poem, but uh, he, fin he finally got a little tired of it. It's kind of like I have some songs on my iPod and I love these songs and yet Frankly, I'm a little tired of them, you know. <laughs> so it's it's that kind of phenomenon, you know. It's also that, you know, I think his frustration that Oh Captain was such an atypical poem for him. It was conventional in its meter and its rhyme, and um, it was not the free verse kind of of um, you know, wide ranging and expressive poetry like uh, Lilacs is. And, you know, of the two poems, I think Lilacs is his masterpiece. But Oh Captain, it, you know, David, one of the things that you pointed out in your book about the Gettysburg and Address and the second inaugural was, you know, how su succinct they are, how few words they have, how few minutes they took to um, uh, deliver. And the same thing is true of Oh Captain, My Captain versus When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom, which is a long, long narrative, basically following this funeral train through the country. Oh, Captain is this short piece. And one of its beauties and one of the reasons why it became the most famous Whitman poem is it was easy for people to recite and to memorize. So in this period of elocution, when everyone was memorizing poems, you know, every, almost every school child in America learned Oh, Captain, My Captain. And I had, I'll just tell a story that when we did the revising myself exhibit at the Library of Congress, I was giving a, a speech uh, or to the, um, the visitors to the exhibit about Whitman in the war years. And um, I got to the sequel of Drum Taps and a man who had come as a visitor to hear the talk just spontaneously recited, oh, captain, my captain, and said that he had learned it when he was five years old. And he was probably 75 at the time that he did it. And to me, it was one of the most moving things that has ever happened to me in my work at the Library of Congress when that happened. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, does anyone wanna jump in with one more question? We could do 
one more. No, all right. Well, that was a great note to end on anyway. So <laughs> wonderful. Oh my gosh, thank you both so much. I'm so happy that we're able to come together like this for this event. And uh, our executive director, Cynthia Shore, would like to offer her words. Let me just make sure. Cynthia, I think I saw you. Yeah, you there you are. Okay. Beautiful. Um, I know, I was looking forward to introducing you, Barbara, and my internet is going out and in here at the apartment. So um, sorry about that, but I heard Caitlin did a wonderful job and I was able to catch part of your, uh, most of your speech and presentation. So thank you for that. And thank you, David. Uh, it's just wonderful to have two Whitman scholars here on today who is, and, and have us looked at history through their eyes and through Whitman stories and through your knowledge of Whitman and the time. So it's been a very special evening for me and I'm sure for everyone in the audience. And uh, we wanna thank you for taking the time out. And I don't know if it was announced that uh, David is uh, being awarded the Lincoln Prize on Monday. And maybe Caitlin, you can put up a link if you haven't already about that. And Barbara uh, is going forward with her transcription and she will be visiting us uh, via Zoom in another one or two programs, uh, continuing her good work with Walt Whitman. And I did wanna say thank you. I made it to the Library of Congress in 2018 and Barbara was most gracious in showing us uh, the Whitman artifacts and taking her time that day. And uh, on, uh, on the, um, chance that I could say this, I would encourage everyone, if you're in the DC area, to go say hello to Barbara. It'll be well worth your time. So thanks to both of you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to your donations that come in. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. And yes, I'm glad that John was able to uh, connect with us from France, and I hope uh, others are learning how to do Zoom and connect with us going forward. Thank you very much. All right, wonderful. Okay, good night, everyone. All right, good night. good night. Thank you, good night. Thank you so much. And those links are in the chat, so I'm gonna give everyone a moment. If you didn't get to click them yet, you can do so now, and we'll open up in your phone somewhere else, and you'll find them again later. Just give you a moment for that. And there's so many familiar faces and new faces, so it's been a really wonderful night. So thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.